Good morning. Good way to start off the day with a little coffee percolating in the background. A little word of God in front of me on the table. We are at Mark chapter number 10. And he arose from thence and come into the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? They were always asking questions that trying to get him in trouble with it. And divorce is a big issue in the Bible. It's in here a bunch. I've covered it a bunch. And, but everywhere it pops up, we'll say something about it. And maybe you've just now started watching these. We went through all the writings of Paul, started with Matthew. Now we're in Mark. And this is a big issue. He says, he answered and says unto them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And just in the last 10 years or so, man's done everything he can to put that last little bit asunder, isn't he? And, you know, that just flies in the face of everything the world teaches us, but, you know, stuff that should be pretty common sense. God made them male and female. He shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the words of the Lord Jesus. Okay, he says, And in the house his disciples uh, asked him again the same matter, and he says unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she commits adultery. It said back in Matthew, and even the guy, if you, you know, a single guy marries this woman that's been put away from her husband, he also commits adultery. Now, again, remember this context. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is not the Apostle Paul. What's the difference? Paul was given a new revelation. He was given something to the, a new thing, a new creation, the body of Christ. This right here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is all continuance of the Old Testament. It's all Jesus in the flesh coming for the people of the flesh, which was Israel, to fulfill the promises to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all these people are still under the law of covenant. That's still going on right here. So you got to look at it. All this stuff you see, you got to look at it through that lens. Not where we are, not as, you know, Gentile body of Christ today. What Paul says about divorce to the body of Christ is that, uh, if I can remember, let's see. If uh, a saved man and woman's married, you know, and it says not to not to not to be divorced, but it says, and if you do, he's talking from a woman's perspective, I think, when he says it, don't marry anybody else or be reconciled to your husband. Same goes for the man, I'm sure. Don't marry another or be reconciled to your wife. But if a, a believer is married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever wants to stay, don't put them away because you may, you know, your lifestyle might cause them to get Jesus on their mind and get saved. But if the unbeliever wants to leave and they leave you, let them go. It says you're not under bondage in such a case. That's for the body of Christ. This here is for Israel. This here is for the, the Father, the, the, the law covenant people. And he says plainly in there that, uh, you know, if you put them away, you've committed adultery. If you marry one that's been put away, you've committed adultery. Even though Moses had told them back then, you know, write a bill of divorcement. And, and Jesus is bringing up this point because they got to the point the way we are now. You just started divorcing people for foolish reasons, just putting them away left and right. And Jesus said, from the beginning, it was not so. So there's that. All right. Now he says, they brought young children unto him that they should touch them, that he should touch them rather. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them and that's the way it goes now there's a lot i don't know how many times i've seen just in the last little bit people complaining about churches uh jumping on parents that have unruly children bringing them telling them not to even bring them back 
and watch what Jesus, this is the same scenario pretty much, watch what Jesus does. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Amen. For such is the kingdom of God. The little children is the kingdom of God. They, some people believe that when little children die that ain't been baptized, that they go to hell. Ain't that foolish? For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So not only do the little children enter in, if you're going to enter in, you're going to have to become as a little child. And you remember how your faith was when you was little? You, you believed, didn't you? I did. And there wasn't nothing but love. There was no judgment. There was no racism when you were a little child. There wasn't none of this foolishness. There was just love and compassion. I think that's the point he's trying to make there. And he took them up into his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. Amen. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. He's running to him, kneels to him and says, Good master, what shall I do to it that I may inherit eternal life? So this man, he's, wanting, he's got a big question and he knows where to go, doesn't he? He goes to the Lord. Jesus says unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that's God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. So every commandment he, he mentioned, you'll notice that it's all the ones how you treat your fellow man. Don't steal from them. Don't kill them. Don't commit adultery with them. Honor your father and mother. He don't mention the ones that concern God, you know. Have no other gods before me. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. But he's going to cover that when he tells him this next little part. But this rich, this rich young ruler, he answers and says, Master, all these I've observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, that's the part that concerns with God, I think, because he's asking him, what, what's the two, two big ones? Love God with all your heart. Love your fellow man. as you, Love your neighbor as yourself. So he's already covered the neighbor. Now he's covering God because he, knows, he already knows this man loves his money more than he loves the Lord. And that's, that's a, a lesson for all of us. If you're going to get right with God, there's something in all of us that we, we have to be willing to not put above the Lord. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he knows this man loves his money more than anything. And it says, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And that's the way it was for this man. And he's not the only one Jesus asked to do this. Every disciple that he called, he pretty much asked to do the same thing in so many words, and they followed him. Peter and Andrew, James and John, their whole living was fishing. But when Jesus said, follow me, they dropped it all and followed him. Same with Matthew the publican. But this man would not leave because he loved his possessions more than he wanted to be part of God's kingdom. Jesus looked around and says unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And remember, I don't know if we've seen it yet in this gospel, the, the parable of the sower of the seed. One of them fell among thorns. That was the cares and riches of the world. Choked it out and it bore no fruit. He says, uh, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answers again and says unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, says, With men it is impossible, but not with God. Amen. He can take that whatever heart, whatever your heart covets, he can break that down and turn it toward him because it's all possible with God, isn't it? For with God, all things are possible, it says. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you that there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time 
houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands and perse with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the, and the last first. <laughs> All right, we've seen this in Matthew 2 where he says uh, the same thing essentially that if you leave all these things, you're going to have you're going to have a hundredfold. But see, Mark adds in this little sentence. He says you're going to receive a hundredfold now in this time. All these things, houses and brethren, sisters, and I don't know how to explain that because you know history teaches this, that all these disciples pretty much died a martyr's death. Pretty sure they didn't have all these things. But the only way I can I can see it is when the church first got started. You remember how they all came together and had everything in common. They had all their houses and all their people, and they just came together and put it all in one big pot. So, I mean, you could maybe look at it that way. I'm not real sure. I don't know about that one. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. Amen. And anybody that says they do know everything, take heed to them. Or, you know, be careful. Don't take heed. To, take heed that you be careful about them, you know, because nobody knows it all. All right, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall arise again. So he just keeps hammering this home. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What, what would ye that I should do for you? And in the other Gospels, it's their mommy that comes and asks this, but... Uh, here it's got them asking it too, apparently. They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Well, they didn't, they didn't hold back, did they? He's already told them. Well, he's fixing to tell them here at some point, you know, if you believe, ask what you want and you shall have. So they're, they're taking him to his word. And, but you've always got to ask according to the Father's will. And you're getting ready to see a little lesson about the Father's will right here. <laughs> But Jesus says unto them, You know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And Jesus is asking them something, and, and they come up with the right answer. They said unto him, We can. Amen, because they're going to get baptized. They've already been baptized in the water, but they were already John's disciples before Jesus showed up. But I don't know if that, that's the baptism that he's looking at. He's uh, probably talking about being baptized unto death. That's what the, the water baptism is a symbol of, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. They said unto him, we can. Jesus says unto him, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. Remember that cup he's talking about letting pass from him in Gethsemane? The cup full of the wrath of God, the cup full of all the sins of the world. He says, uh, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all, ye shall be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it was prepared. And it don't say it here, but he's talking about what the Father's given, you know. It's already in his will. And he doesn't know who's going to sit on the right hand and left hand. All righty. And when the ten heard it, all right, the rest of them caught wind of it, didn't they? They began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and says unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercises lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be the men, shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. And Jesus is the ultimate example of that. He's getting ready to tell you that even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, excuse me, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. He didn't come to everybody just flock around and worship him now. That's going to happen later. He came 
to minister to all the rest of them. And that's what he's telling them to do. If you're going to be last, if you're going to be first, you're going to be last. You're going to be servant of all. If you're going to be chief, you're going to be servant. <laughs> all right, last little part here. They came to Jericho, and as he went out to Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the wayside, high, the highway side, begging. All right, this blind man sitting there begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Now, he was sitting there begging for money, but when he hears it's Jesus, he starts begging for something else, doesn't he? He began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calls you. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus says unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Amen. See, that's that was always part of the message then. It should still be now. All these things. It, it just draws people in to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How compassionate he is. How merciful he is. And he's just wonderful. I love you guys. God bless you. We'll see you in the morning.